Yo, welcome, friends of the Risen King. My name is Enoch, your unapologetically traditional Catholic rapper. Um, and I have with me today Nicholas. How do you spell it? Is your last name? Cav Cavazos? Cavazos, yes, sir. Cavazos, perfect. Thank you, Nick. Um, Nick is, uh, you are the um, traditional Thomas, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. You're also on the Meaning of Catholic, and you have your own YouTube channel as well, correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, Meaning, meaning of Catholic. Over there, yeah. we the Monday morning show. So every Monday morning, you can find me over there. We usually talk Sweet. about all kinds of different subjects, as well as every other Tuesday evening. We also do a show, myself and Angela Erickson. I'm sure you guys all know. Great Shout girl. out to Angela. Shout Angela's yeah. amazing, yeah. Angela's Wonderful great. lady. So we go in. Yeah, there she is right there. Uh, we were on her show, integrated uh, with Angela, but we call it's actually the ascent in the context of the meaning of Catholic. And so Wonderful. there, and then uh, if anyone wants to read any of my writings, I'm over at 1 Peter 5 as well, but uh, I think right. you have to be pretty nerdy to read my writings, not going to lie. Oh. So. <laughs> uh, hey, what's up, Angela? What's up, Lou? Andy? Um, <laughs> she said what makes me feel so old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Texas. We're respectful. Yeah, embrace it, Angela. <laughs> embrace it. Um, brother, uh, I just, this is a get to know you. People are here to come to get to know you. I'm going to ask you questions. We're going to go all the way back. Let's start off from the very beginning. We know your name now. What decade were you born in? I was born in the 90s. Yeah, so very, very late 90s, 1998, okay. June of 1998. So uh, I don't remember anything from it, but I'm practically a 2000s kid. So, you know, yeah, growing yeah. up Lodian, Drake and Josh, you yeah. know, Zach and Cody, all of that good stuff. You know, everything was very peaceful with the Iraq war in the background, you know. So that was my my upbringing. That's right. That's right. 9 11, all that stuff happened around that time, mm -hmm. huh? Um, mm -hmm. So where, where, where'd you grow up? Texas the whole time? Yeah. So I was born in Lubbock, Texas, which, if anyone knows anything about that city, it is flat. Flat, flat. It's out in the middle of the panhandle of Texas. <laughs> and uh, it's, I think, you, some, you could make the argument it's the reddest portion of America politically. It's very conservative out there. That's not it's bad. Great. Okay. I'll take yeah, it. Yeah. And it reflects me pretty well because I'm extremely conservative. But we moved to central Texas when I was six months old. So I've grown up in a little town called Wimberley, Texas, my entire life. And so yeah. that's where I've yeah. been at. You ever seen that movie, No Country for Old Men? Oh, it's such a good film. Such you remember that film. my favorite my favorite scene, I think one of the top favorite scenes of all movies is when he's at the gas station. We raised mm -hmm. a family in Temple, Texas. Remember that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, there's so many good I I connect so much with that film because yeah. I feel like I am those old men. I, I'm just like my state has changed so much, not for the not for the better in many ways. Right, right. No, yeah, that's a, that's such a that's a good movie. Every, every time someone says Texas, it just reminds me of that scene. It's a great, it's one of my favorite scenes. It's a great scene. It flips mm -hmm. the coin. Anyway, so you you were born in the late '90s. You grew up in Texas, born and raised in Texas, um, born in one of the most conservative state uh, of areas in, in the country. You said, right? Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your childhood. Like, were you the type of person that would be outside a lot, riding bikes, playing with friends, or were we probably the generation that kind of started sitting home, you know, at a young age. I've told my friend once that I think yeah. my generation, specifically like the, the beginning of Gen Z, was yes. the last vestiges of like playing outside. Because I was mm. a play outside, run around with friends, get on the bicycles, kid. It was just wonderful growing up. Even where I live currently, we live yeah. out, we have a good stretch of almost 10 acres, but the acreage nice. that's around our property is for the most part uninhabited so practically speaking it's about 400 acres of forest that i'm in the middle of right now right now and yeah right now and uh, it That's is just fun. beautiful and so we would build forts growing up me and so i was homeschooled and so we had a we had a little bit of a homeschool co-op and so all of us kids would usually come together do school but then after school we would go build forts we climb in trees Nice. We'd go, we would, every summer was either in the pool or in the rivers that are around here. We'd ride bikes. We would, you know, we were definitely, since we were, you know, 
Protestant homeschoolers, I think are like games that we would play. It, if it wasn't something historical, I was the history nerd. So I would always want to play civil war, American revolution <laughs> as a Texan. You got to play the Alamo when you're a kid. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, You have to. And, but we would also play, you know, we'd play Narnia. We play Lord of the Rings. We'd all, you know, get in fights over who could be Peter, who could be Edmund. Mm. I was like, I don't want to be Edmund. You know, he's just this coward. But then, Later on as an adult, I'm like, dang, that redemption story hit so hard. And yeah. so, but yeah, that was my childhood. It was, it was wonderful growing up. That's, that's really cool. Would you say that playing outside, having an imagination, um, I'm sure you did a lot of reading, did that shape your, your thinking and to help you bring, to bring you into, I, I guess you would say you're a, not so much a Catholic nerd uh, at the moment, but, uh, um, you know, you're a very smart guy. You understand Thomas. You love Catholic theology. Would you say that shaped some of that? Or do you think if you would have sat home and played video games all day, it would have been different? That's a good question. I think it definitely does shape it because, you know, everything that we, the whole world that we live in is cause and effect. And depending on what you are exposed to when your brain is developing, hey, you're you? going to be yeah. able to. Um, see the world in different ways, you know, in many ways. And so how I, I have a very good imagination now. One of my hobbies actually is I love to write Western novels. None of them are published yet, but that's a, it's a, it's a hobby of mine, but what a, a good imagination, you know, and a, the imagination is actually one of the four internal, uh, if you will, parts of our soul, one of the four internal senses, if you will. And having a good, well-formed imagination allows the intellect to be able to conceive of things on a much, uh, I guess, easier way. So it's like we all can understand abstracts like universal truths, universal concepts, even something as basic as like, what is a circle? What is what is circleness? What is squareness? Things yeah. like that. But then at the same time, it's like, well, if you're only exposing yourself to TV, to video games, to things like that, it's not going to be your your brain is just going to get used to dopamine highs. And so thankfully, right. we didn't, at least in my specific household, <clears throat> we we kind of watched. Hey, absolutely. One hundred percent. Absolutely. Uh, my Western novels do have a, a tad bit of Thomas in them, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's kind of hard matching 13th century yeah. scholasticism with 1873 Colt 45. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, I think that. Yeah, we thankfully didn't. I didn't play video games as a child in our household. We didn't have it until I was about 13. Mm -hmm. And when we got it, I remember playing for about 30 minutes and just being like, all right, you know, that's kind of yeah. it. And then we got rid of cable television in 2007. So George Bush was still president when we got rid of that. And if you think about that, it's like if I'm born in 98, right? And then we get rid of it in 2007 and it's 2023. Most yeah. of my life has been spent with outside television so right it's, it's right, pretty right you're not outsourcing a device to fulfill your imagination you're, you're internalizing and bringing it in which is that, that's that, that's fantastic and i think that's one of the reasons why i think you're you're so intelligent and in understanding of these the natural law and piecing the divine law together with a Thomistic sense but let's go back to your to your childhood and i just i want to know what was your saturday morning cartoon like what did you like watching my saturday morning cartoon early on oh. yeah my, I guess if I had to pick one, this one's kind of niche, but have have you heard of the Redwall series before? Never. See, this this is something that I think some Catholics would get. So, there's a series out there. It's originally a book series, but it became a television cartoon series that would come on Saturday mornings, and it was a series based off of a Catholic writer named Brian Jakes, who basically told moral stories through uh, cartoons, and these cartoons were mainly depicted of there was this abbey with mice that lived in the abbey and you could basically substitute mice as humans in this world. And they would always fight against like armies of rats, armies of other like evil creatures and stuff like that. Um, oh, great. Guys, you guys know. Um, but the good know guys, okay. Yeah, it's great. The good guys were always very distinctly separate from the bad guys. And it was always a good moral story of like good triumphing over evil. And there was this one character called Martin the Warrior who was kind of like this almost deity-like factor in the books. But Brian Jakes tried to, in, in small ways, hint him as being kind of a Christ-like figure. 
And so, um, yeah, definitely recommend the books to read. It's fantastic. And then the cartoons, they were pretty good watching growing up. Um, I definitely loved that. And then if I had to say any other kind of things that I like to watch in that time, even though they're not cartoons, yeah. Drake and Josh, hands down, which is <laughs> an amazing yeah. show. It, it, it's one of those shows that, like, the, the meme worthiness continues to hold on. And when you just hear that mm -hmm. intro theme, you're like, wow, this, I have just been transported back to 2004. My yeah. childhood started. It's, it's phenomenal. That's really funny. Yeah, shout out to the Rudolph, man. It's an amazing family. I know, I know them personally. It's a great, great family. Chad and Katie are amazing. Um, but so go, going back and talking about Drake and Josh, so that's something you were watching. Did you get an into any like the classic cartoons at all, like the, the Spider Mans and uh, you know Ninja Turtles back in the days, the He Man, or were you, were you specifically watching stuff that was of your of your time? Yeah, you know, so I would say, I guess maybe two things. So one, I, I, I did look at some comics very briefly when I was a kid. Sure. And it was mainly like my grandparents would actually, this was a long time ago, but newspapers actually used to carry some like serial comics inside of their like large editions that they would drop off at the house in Texas. Yeah. And so I would get some Spider-Man comics every once in a while. They'd be pretty cool. cool. But really my go-to like Drake and Josh was great, but my go-to just watching in general as a kid from like yeah. very, very early on to right now, this it shows you how much I have not changed, has been actually Western films, specifically my favorite actor being John Wayne. And so I remember as That's a kid, cool, man. Yeah, yeah, I remember as a yeah. kid, five, six, every day, no joke, every single day asking my mom, can we put on The Searchers, right? The old 1965 film, sure. The Searchers. Sure. Which is interesting because of all of his films, it's kind of you could argue it's maybe his darkest film and yeah. showing that to like a six year old. But you know, when you're yeah. a kid, you're just like, it's cool action, you know, it's cowboys and Indians, et cetera, et cetera. This is before, you know, everything was hyper PC. And so thankfully, uh, yeah, I would just like, I binge watch those as a kid and I still do to this day. I, I, I absolutely love it. So that's really what I, my go to would be. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I did hear a story of John Wayne. He, he did not like Clint Eastwood for the very yeah. sp specific reason I think I heard because Clint would complicate things and he would make it seem like the bad guy sometimes was actually good and you know yeah. that, that morality was subjective. Is that a true story? No, that's a great question. So there's definitely some truth to the story and it's actually mm -hmm. somewhat of a funny story on top okay. of it. So what happened was is that in 1970, John Wayne was filming, uh, I think this was in 1970 anyway, he had just finished filming or he was just filming a film called The Shootist. And John Wayne, uh, during that time, right, he, you know, he was already very popular, right? He became really popular through his, his like major debut with John Ford, the great godfather of Westerns, in the 1930 film The Stagecoach. So by this time mm -hmm. in 1970, he's already, you know, a big wig very influential things like that. But Clint Eastwood in the late 60s had just done the Man with No Name trilogy, right? That famous trilogy That's that right. most people I think think of when they think of Westerns today. I think the Man with No Name, arguably, I think you can definitely say this, especially like The Good and the Bad, The Ugly, yeah. is probably the number one go-to Western film for non-Western fans sure. and things like that, sure. uh, which is a great film. So, But what was interesting in those films was Unlike through maybe like the 30s through the 50s, where all of the Western films, whether they be films or TV shows, they all were what you could coin as the classical Western being good versus evil, right versus wrong, very romanticized picture of the West, which I love. That's kind of my era. Um, but John Wayne was really, he was really, you know, capitalized into this. Well, one of the main staples of those films is when it comes time for the final duel, the good guy allows the bad guy to draw first. Well, in that trilogy that came out later on in the 60s with Clint Eastwood, he was doing this with an Italian director named Sergio Leone, this is, and who, was, who was basically the godfather of Italian westerns in the context of being, it being like massively popular over there. Sure. And this is how the, Jap the Japanese ended up calling it for the first time macaroni westerns, which we started calling spaghetti westerns, uh, based off of the Italian background. That's so Clint Eastwood, he... Yeah, he filmed those three films over in Spain and Italy. But in those films, because it was the 60s and culture is just imploding in the 60s, mm -hmm. Sergio Leone was just like, why do we need this like good versus bad kind of figure? Isn't good and bad somewhat subjective? Why don't we make it anti-hero type of character? 
And so when you look at Clint Eastwood's character, you know, it's like he's good, but you can't really say he's good at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is how this ties in with John Wayne is that you would see Clint Eastwood. He would always shoot people in the back. He would always draw first, things like that. And Clint was one time asked, he said, you know, we know that the, you do this in your films different than John Wayne. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I don't understand. Why wouldn't you draw first? Like, it just makes sense to do. Mm -hmm. Well, when John Wayne was filming The Shootist, he was told by his director, he's like, okay, I want you to go around right at the corner and I want you to shoot the guy. John Wayne, being the big old conservative he was, he was just like, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to shoot him in the back. He's like, I'm not shooting him in the back. And he's like, <laughs> and then the director, he made the unwise decision of saying in that moment, Clint Eastwood would shoot him in the back. Oh, no, you don't do that. Don't and do that. John Wayne famously said, I don't care what that kid would have done. I'm not going to shoot him in the back. So, but that was his main, he never had a major scuffle, but that was yeah. his major like comment that he ever made about him. It would have been epic to say the least if they could have made a film together. That would have been one of the zenith films of all time, and it's sure. such a shame they didn't. Yeah, no, that's true. You being a big Western fan, I'm, I, I like Western films. Um, my boys like to watch the series. Is it Roy something, the show, the, the Roy something show? It's like back in the like, Black and white and interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember what that one would be called. But the, the, there's like there's a ton of great ones from uh, is, Gunsmoke yeah. to The Rifleman to yeah. Bonanza. They're all right. they're all fun. good stuff. Also, yeah. Did you ever? And this just could be me and my my weird way of like searching for things early on in life. Did you ever watch anything from Terrence Hill and 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 but uh, Trinity is my name. It's like a it's like a kind of comedic western. I remember Bud, being, Bud Spencer and Terrence Hill. Yeah, I remember being exposed to it and yeah. thinking like it was very odd. And I think the problem with me was is that, you know, it's like if you've grown up watching John Wayne, but yeah. then you jump into that kind of a western film, you're just kind of like what's going on? I think maybe the closest of where I've gotten into that world was since I love old movies in general, one of my absolute favorite t uh, like trilogies is Back to the Future, right? In the old, in the eighties. Oh 80s. yeah, yeah, that's classic, absolutely, absolute classic. But in the yeah. but in the third one, you see them go back. I mean, spoiler alert. I mean, it's been what sixty years. No, yeah, <laughs> if you haven't time. seen it, I mean, come on, give me a break, right? Spoiler yeah, it's more alert. of a problem yeah. on your end if you haven't seen yeah, it already. Yeah, come on. But. <laughs> um, but then the third film, right? They go back to the old west, and right, right. it's kind of like somewhat of a uh, you know modern dystopian style western where it's like right. you know we're using somewhat modern technology being you know a flying delorean space <laughs> machine back in 1885 trying right. to go back to 1985 after just leaving 1955 right, and right. so yeah just phenomenal got it okay cool so kid continuing on you um you were homeschooled your entire life Homeschooled uh, until essentially homeschooled. So I was homeschooled directly under the tutelage of my mom and dad until mm. eighth grade. But then grade. With, with, some, with a kind of a co-op, you know, we would have mm. uh, other parents teach and things like that. And it was very good. It was um, for a lot, maybe people who aren't aware about homeschooling, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes, some absolutely deserved <laughs> about homeschoolers. Um, <laughs> but one of the stereotypes that I definitely take issue with um, is whenever they kind of just assume that it's like the parent r just teaching out of random like books and stuff to their children. And that's just not how it was. Like all of us, we used an actual curriculum that yeah. was, you know, approved and everything. And it was like a classical education Christian program. And so we read through the classics. I remember reading like, you know, late into the evenings in like fourth, fifth grade, we would read the Iliad, the Odyssey, Moby Dick, Treasure Island, all those types of things. Um, but when I got to eighth grade, my parents felt that what would be most beneficial for my education would be to send me to a private school that was mainly populated uh, or attended rather by homeschoolers. And so it was more or less a official exalted co-op where it was an actual private school. And it was phenomenal. Um, it was an interesting school because what took place was it would be teachers who had not just degrees in their field. Right? All the, the teachers had at least a master's degree or above. 
Um, but they also had experience in their fields. So as an example, my science teacher, who was also the science uh, head department, she worked for wow. NASA, for example, as wow. one of their uh, like top advisors when it came to some of the space launches and stuff like that. And she would, uh, she, you know, she was a little bit older. And so she was kind of, you know, in that kind of somewhat retirement age, wanting to kind of pass on information. And so we would have teachers like that. And then they also, all the teachers also had experience in youth ministry. So it was actually somewhat mm. interesting because it's like, you know, they came from a Protestant background, could link in the Bible into class, and that's completely fun and encouraged, um, as well as just teaching proper education. Right. And so it was, it was, it was wonderful. At that time, what was your de denomination background? So yeah, my denominational background, I, for those viewers who don't know, I was baptized as an infant in the Catholic Church. Yeah, okay. Oh, six wow. months after I was born. And six months after I was born goes to tell you uh, the state of, I guess, my parents' Catholicism because, um, yeah, you don't want to do it six months. <laughs> yeah, do, do, do it as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, but uh, but my father, so my father grew up uh, in a family of 10, and yeah. they were a, a kind of a somewhat strong Catholic family. My grandfather, God rest his soul, his name was Lotto Cavazos, and he was uh, the first Hispanic cabinet member. He was actually uh, a U.S. cabinet member, so he was Secretary yeah. of Education for Ronald Reagan. Wow. Uh, his and then he was also Secretary of Education for um, George Dub Sr., right? George. First George Bush. Yeah. And uh, so he he came from a single uh, single room schoolhouse on the King Ranch. That's where my ancestry comes back to. So my family has been in America since 1793 in northern Mexico and southern Texas. Cool. Yeah, really in on the con in the con context, excuse me, of the King Ranch. And so all growing up Catholic, all growing up as vaqueros, so cowboys uh, tending to Mr. King's work and my grandfather was the first one to kind of break that and go off and get his doctorate degree he ended up getting something like 27 honorary doctorate degrees That's just dope. absolutely wow. brilliant man wonderful man uh he was very humorous so he wasn't just like a walking encyclopedia and he had 10 children and he was extremely devout but when the nonsense of the 60s transpired mm -hmm. he went from you know going to mass every day, praying his rosary every day, being very involved in his parish to not having any of his kids confirmed. And it was just such a massive scandal. Uh, and so what ended up taking place, my dad, he's number nine in the list of 10. He grew up very nominally Catholic, you know, went to catechism class. According to him, you know, he says he doesn't remember any of it. But when he married my mom, who comes from a uh, missionary Baptist background, which for those of you viewers who don't know what that is, that's essentially like a very conservative, you know, suit and tie wearing, Bible thumping, hard preaching, hymn singing, chicken eating Baptist church, you know, things along that. And uh, so when they got married, my, they, they still baptized me in the Catholic church, but it was six months after I was born, we entered into a non-denominational sect. And so from age six months old, all the way up until 19, mm -hmm. I believe it was 19, 1920, something like that. I was in the context of non-denominationalism, which you could think of this specific church as kind of like, you know, Baptist without the, the term Baptist in the, <laughs> in, in the name, you know, praise and worship singing, um, youth groups uh, and things along that nature. And I was a bit different than the rest of the kids because I was always interested in theology from a very young age, six uh, or seven. And so I was... Thankfully, bless, you know, my parents, they really poured the scriptures into me and my mm -hmm. siblings. So we would memorize uh, many hundreds of verses for like Bible memory contests at the church. We would have sword drills, which are basically a, a person calls out a Bible reference. and You try to find it as quick as you can. Mm -hmm. um, things along that nature. And then um, I was very much so while my parents definitely were way more involved in the charismatic movement. I definitely was way more involved in what you could call like classical Calvinism, like hardcore Calvinism. Oh, okay. Wow, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. Dr. James White was your guy, huh, at the time? Yeah, James White. Yeah. Uh, I liked John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul's, yeah, yeah. I, know. yeah. I, was, I would say if I had to pick one, though, I was definitely more old school because it's like while I listened to them, my love was reading the Puritans. And so 
Jonathan yeah. Edwards, John yeah. Owen, Matthew Henry, um, mm-hmm. and then even later reformers, uh, if you could really call them that, but people like uh, Charles Spurgeon, John Gill, things like that. I mean, just, yeah, it was, you know, it taught me quite a bit, but one of the, mm-hmm. like, in the context of scripture, I'm definitely thankful for exposing me to a massive amount of scripture. But sure, the downside sure. was, is it was all heavily imbued with anti Catholicism. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the founding of Calvinism was anti-Catholicism to mm-hmm. begin with. So now moving on. So did you play any sports at the school? That, that, so that not in the school, but I did play sports. I actually was involved in a lot of cross-country and track running, which is what a lot of people don't know. Right. And uh, I was, I'd say, a decent-ish player. So there was a couple races where I would uh, get first place, so which mm-hmm. would be pretty fun. My dad is actually a track runner. Um, so that was, uh, you know, kind of fun father and son running together. Um, but I was more or less kind of just like going along to get along, if you will. And what ended up happening is essentially is like, you know, I was just kind of an average student trying to get that PE credit, if you will. And so, but yeah, that was my, 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 my sport growing up for the most part. Got a question from the audience here. Angela asks, what are your thoughts about the role of charismatic Catholicism in the church, properly ordered, and what would it yeah, like, what would that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. It's definitely a big question. Um, it's a question yeah. that maybe she and I should cover in a show <laughs> one time when we have like a whole hour to talk about. But I'd say short answer, from all my studies, so I'll say this. I came out, my, because of my parents, right, I came out of, you know, when I converted to Catholicism, some pretty hyper charismatic stuff. I've seen some pretty crazy stuff in my life. Um, and like, it was so insane that not to <laughs> lie. Yeah, it's not, not, a, not a bad idea. Next um, topic's already done for you guys. All right. <laughs> exactly. I, it was such a bad experience, hyper charism, yeah. at least my personal experience with hyper charismania, that not gonna lie. I knew when I converted to Catholicism that I needed a lot of, um, let's just say, one-on-one talks with the Holy Spirit because I had such a negative and damaged view of the Holy Spirit. Like, it was so bad that I was just like, anytime someone just mentioned Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. there was just like at least a little alarm bell. Like, what do you mean? What do you mean by this? Like, what do you mean? It It wouldn't even have to do anything with charismatic thought. It would just be someone brings it up in some type of theological context and it's just like you know what's going on you know almost kind of like a trigger word which i don't even have those but you know yeah. uh it was just insane but to answer the specific question i did a lot of healing from it and so how i view it i mean i'm a traditionalist through and through i definitely think that while there's definitely certain merits to it in the context of I, when you see certain individuals who are charismatic catholics i'm yeah. thinking of it as an example um, I, think, I believe it's he's a doctor, but Dr. Ralph Martin, mm-hmm. great guy, um, you know, very, very holy man. Um, but theologically wise, I definitely as a Thomist do have some issues with it. Chiefest of which is when we look at the mystical theology of the church, we recognize that it's essentially unanimous that all the mystical doctors are basically saying any type of like experience of something Thing supernatural right we won't even just say god but of something supernatural that is the more expressive it is and the more attention drawing it is for yourself the more likely it's from the devil and sure. i'm not saying therefore that charismatics are from the devil or their thoughts from the devil but i'm just sure. saying with that proviso that you can kind of fall into a little bit of a very self-centered very self-expressive theology now if it's very much so like you know you want to be very more in touch with the holy ghost that's totally fine. Um, yeah. Maybe it's just not my but, cup of tea. That was uh, that was in, in the sh- short Saint John of the Cross's message too, in his warning mm-hmm. when, he, when he speaks about the charismatic movement in, in, in that sense. So mm-hmm. um, people who are always seeking consolation, um, yeah, yeah it can be yeah, extremely yeah. dangerous because because yes, yes. yes. even if consolation comes from God, which God will give us, sure, we, we should really then still get rid of it um yes. not because we're trying to you know like refuse god or something but because right. the problem is is that consolation it's it's like spiritual sugar and what takes yes. place is it's so easy for us as very wounded beings 
who have a strong tendency toward self-love and um, we'll get attached toward, to that. Yeah, to get attached to it, and, and yeah. it's scary because yeah. it is so easy for us to um, fall into some serious depravity. And so, what's better to do is to practice those virtues as opposed to latching onto attachments. Beautiful. Thank, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for the question, Angela. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so moving on. So track and field was. Did you watch any sports at all? Like, are you a sports fan? I, I really have the TV until after 2007. There was no more television. But did you watch any sports? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I believe it or not, did keep up. So I wouldn't say our family is a very big sports family, but I definitely mm -hmm. enjoyed watching sports when I would go over to say like my, my grandparents' house or my friends' houses. And so it would mainly be watching Texas Ranger baseball. It was just, yeah, um, especially cool. in the summertime, I would just spend a lot of time going over in the evenings and hanging out with my grandparents because they live in the same town that I do. Uh, so that's great. And so we would watch baseball. We'd cook hot dogs. We'd, you know, bring out all of the different condiments. That's and we'd dope, watch baseball. Yeah. Every night. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was great, you know, very wholesome. Yeah. Preparing for heaven says, people were babbling and gibberish and calling it speaking in tongues. You know, it reminds me of, car buyer remorse when they say shit about a honda but about a hyundai mm -hmm. that's, what mm -hmm. all, that's what they always say so anyway so um mm -hmm. so you you like to watch so you're watching sports what about um uh, let's let's move on to uh, like pop culture as far as like music um who would you say right now is your favorite catholic rapper <laughs> well i think the question could be better phrased <laughs> Does, does the traditional Thomas consider rap a form of music? <laughs> no. <laughs> and it's, it's not. <laughs> no, it's really I'm just shocked. Yeah. Hey, I will, I will admit this. So I'll, I'll first say, <laughs> if you guys couldn't assume I'm not the world's biggest fan of rap, but I will say this. The first time I was exposed to yeah. Mr. Enoch's music was in the context, I think this was exactly. correct, was in the context of, Anthony and Rob from Avoiding Babylon, shout out to both of them, playing the music oh, yeah. as their intro for their game shows, which they need to bring back, bring back the yes. game show. Um, and they would play it. And I remember thinking, dang, this is a good song. I think the song was called like Unite the Clans or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's and right. I was yeah. just like, dang, this is a good song. I mean, it's a little sad yeah. I'm not in the song, but it's a good song. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got to make and, a part two because there's so many people that I've met after I didn't mention and like I didn't mention you, and I, I, Eric, uh, uh, um, and Angela, I, I didn't, I didn't mention um, Jesse Romero, and I've been kicking myself because oh, I, I, I love Jesse. Like Jesse's one of my favorite people, but no, yeah. I, I, I ask that question to every guest, and I, it's, it's just a fun mm -hmm. question. I, I, half of the people are like I, I only know one Catholic rapper. Yeah, I was about to say I don't know any others. Not right. gonna lie. <laughs> right, right. No, that's okay. Yeah, there's there's not too many. There are some out there, but they're not too many. So let's stick on the music. You, you have a banjo behind you. Do you play banjo? I do. Yeah. So this one right here, that's an Irish four string banjo. Wow. Which I'm all right at. But the other banjo that I have, it's put away at the moment. But it's that's just the classic bluegrass five string banjo. And so I play banjo, play guitar, I play uh, the violin, and um, they're all great instruments. Definitely the banjo is my favorite because. Um, it's one of those instruments that, on the one hand, it's very easy to play. It's, so it's tuned to an open G, so it's very, very easy to play. Yeah. Um, for the most part, what people find hard is like the picking maneuvers that you do because you know you're using three fingers with mm. three picks on them to, to to make music. The only downside about it is it's like with banjos, you really can only play like one or two genres of music that are all somewhat related. And at the same time, because it already sounds like a broken guitar, if you suck at playing the banjo, everyone knows, you know, it just, <laughs> it, so, uh, but yeah, people have asked me, should I play on stream sometime? And I tell them, if you will super chat me a hundred bucks, why not? I'll do it. I'll do it for a super chat of a hundred dollars. But uh, until yeah. that moment, until that moment, and I won't say right. what I'll play. I might play something very, very it. Southern. It's, yeah, you know? it's worth it. You could pay a hundred bucks to go to a silly concert. How about pay a hundred bucks to watch Nick play the banjo? I mean, it's worth it. Um, so, do, are, are you a fan of the uh, the, the hillbilly Thomas? You know, so I've met them. I have, have met you? them. I didn't know that. Okay. 
That's yeah, cool. yeah. So for for those of you guys who haven't seen After My Name, you see OP. So I am a third order Dominican. And uh, although I'm not a third order Dominican uh, involved with the specific province that they come from, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, I have met them. So I've gone up a couple of times to Washington, D.C. to do some of those Thomistic circles that are up there. Yeah. Phenomenal conferences most of the time. Sometimes uh, <laughs> yeah. that's not a bad idea. Or what you could do is I could come, come to wherever you are and just be strumming it in the background and then you make a video of yourself doing that. And then yeah. that would be better. Uh, 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 Angela, you and Tim Gordon, y'all could <laughs> skateboard all day long while uh, while Nick's, while Nick's uh, strumming the banjo. That's perfect. So, I'll so drive in a truck next to you and do that. <laughs> uh, so um, let's uh, – so what, what kind of music do you like listening to? Like what's your favorite genre? Honestly, so favorite genre I probably would say would be bluegrass, just because bluegrass. I mean, it's it's the culture I love down bluegrass, here. Bluegrass, man, it's such such cool music. That's like my cigar music. If I was smoking a cigar, I want oh, some yeah. bluegrass music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, bluegrass. I do like old country, so old Texas country is very good. Um, modern country is not good, to put it bluntly um not good and um but other musics that i like so i like some old classic rock old classic rock i don't necessarily have a particular favorite artist just I, but i do a lot i enjoy some old classic rock i also enjoy classical music a lot from playing the violin um sure. and then honestly my music tastes after that get really really weird so it's like it, it could be like just so random it can be on the one end of it like classic celtic music like yeah yeah this sounds pretty cool but then like swing it all the way over and it's just like yeah if you got some like really cool 80s sounding synth pop or something like i can jam out to that too and so somewhat diverse that's kind of a a rare moment for me to be that interested in like synth pop most people wouldn't know that about me but uh yeah no you know who you'd like you you might like hollowed you know yeah i don't think so He's uh he's a traditional Catholic. He plays every instrument. Um, oh wow! Yeah, and and uh, he's he, his music is 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 more is more you know punk rock, but he's got a little bit of that eighties you know. So you should check him out. Um, I'll send you something of his after that. He's he's a good kid. Um, okay. But um, so moving on, so good for music. Let's talk about food. Hmm. All right. Um, what was Growing up, like, what was your that, that breakfast that you, you absolutely loved that your mom made or your dad? Yeah. So my dad was – my dad's definitely the breakfast king in this household. And so <laughs> being uh, in Texas, you got to have breakfast tacos. I mean, just, like, legitimate breakfast tacos. I go to some other states sometimes to visit relatives sure. and friends, and I try their breakfast tacos, and I'm like, this is the fakest thing I've ever seen. But it, it's so bad. But, yeah, it's like – it's not that it's not that hard. Here's what here's what you do, guys. You, you get a flour tortilla, right? You cook it up. You just take some eggs, some potatoes, some bacon, put some cheese on top. Make sure it's all melted. And there you go. Like it's yeah. very simple. Or corn would even be better too. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it was breakfast tacos. My dad he would throw in like onions. Um, he would throw in uh, even some tomato slices. So it'd be like really good breakfasts. And then uh, my mom she would actually make some pretty mean pancakes growing wow. up. Wow. Wow. Cool. But yeah, I'd say breakfast tacos are definitely hands down the favorite breakfast. Were you were you a pancake or waffle kind of guy? Waffle for sure. Waffle, for waffle sure, only yeah. because <laughs> I was weird when I was a kid. I had this experience with a pancake where my mom. This was, was like one of the first memories I have of pancakes. My mom, just being a normal mom, put syrup yeah. on top, and I yeah. am just such a weird person sometimes because it's like if I just like don't like the way that it looks or smells or sometimes feels like i'm just not into it so i remember thinking this is incredibly sticky i'm never eating a pancake again and so after that point i would always have waffles with peanut butter on top of it that would be like my go-to breakfast if it wasn't breakfast tacos now of course i'll have pancakes with with, uh, syrup on top but honestly i feel like syrup that early in the morning for me i'm just like that's a lot of sugar you know yeah unless you got like some some good old natural maple yeah. syrup. I can I can yeah 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 and Jemima's you know that stuff <laughs> that fake stuff you know don't put that on your body. Um, so yeah, now it's banned. So 
so you don't even have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. What is uh um what's what, what would you say is your death row meal? Oh, yeah. that's a good question. Yeah, death row meal. So this was my favorite food growing up, and it still is to this day. So just classic fried chicken uh, with mashed potatoes, green beans, and then for dessert, classic bluebell and chocolate chip ice cream. Goes to show you how Texan I am. Oh, <laughs> so, that, that, that is so American. <laughs> that is so mm -hmm. American. That's really cool. Um, like, what would you, does Texas have good fried chicken there? Oh, yeah, we have great fried chicken. The thing is with Texas is like we – I mean, if I had to pick a second, it would be barbecue. I mean, but between – and sometimes they kind of go between each other, which one's my favorite. It's really fried yeah. chicken at the end of the day. I just have cravings sure. of barbecue. But, but yeah, no, um, Texas has great – we have – especially in East Texas. So I live in Central Texas, but in East Texas, East Texas is more like authentically Southern culture. So it's way more closer to like Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi style culture. Oh, okay. But they still wear cowboy hats. Um West Texas, North Texas, South Texas, all Cowboys, Central Texas, where I'm at, there's good conservatives, and then there's the People's Republic of Austin, um, yeah. which you know, <laughs> just like, meat, how dare you offend that animal's feelings? Um, yes. And so, so yeah, but we have great, we have great fried chicken uh, from all different kinds of like backgrounds and flavors, whether that be like the Cajun influence in East Texas or just so, like the cowboy cooking fried chicken. And then, of course, barbecue. Got the best barbecue in the world down here with our smoked briskets. Can't beat them. I was just in Dallas a, about a month ago, and um, uh, I had a studio session with a good friend of mine, another Catholic rapper that you don't know. I was like, we all uh, know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, so no, I met with Marshall, and then uh -huh. after that, I, I met uh, with uh, C26. He's one of the Catholic rappers, and he took me out to some good barbecue. Uh, barbecue joint it was at the top ten okay. in Dallas. Oh, great! And, okay, man, that, that brisket was out of this world. Now I think Kentucky's got some pretty good brisket here, um, but mm -hmm. that that brisket in Texas was just out of this world, and the portions were insane. I'm like, I ordered a mm -hmm. half, and it was like I couldn't even finish it. And I'm a big guy. <laughs> this is lab it's just a massive slab they put down on the table yeah yeah and then they had the, the burnt ends now that's some good yeah, stuff. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's great yeah yeah we're, we're, we're making angela really hungry right now so <laughs> um let's pause real quickly and play a quick game this or that yeah cool all right let's just get started um you just got to answer quickly would you rather so be the smartest person in the world or the richest person in the world smartest person in the world Save a hundred strangers or one loved one? Hmm. I would say probably probably a hundred strangers off the top of my head because there's at least a greater good that's gonna come out of it. I like it. So see the future or change the past? Past is the past. So see the future. Got it. Would you rather have sight or sound? So be blind or deaf? Oh, definitely. I, I keep my sight. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Keep my sight. W words or logic? I'm sorry, logic or emotions? Oh, logic. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a liberal. <laughs> I think the same thing, too. Yeah. We'll leave the emotions to the broadest. Uh, words or actions? Mm -hmm. hmm. I would say probably action. Action, okay. because at the end of the day, while the intellect is the highest faculty in one sense, you got to choose. The will, right? Uh, mm -hmm. let's see, uh, predictability or excitement? Um, I guess I'd ask in what context, but I would say probably, I'd say predictability. Okay. Would you rather have skill or popularity? Skill. Like nunchuck skills, bone <laughs> skills. Right? Yeah, 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 Napoleon. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> Computer hacking skill. Um, uh, poor and happy or rich and miserable. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, no, poor and happy for sure. All right, would you rather be feared or respected? Respected, because I think I think if you're genuinely respected, I think people will have a certain amount of fear for you. That's a good answer. Good answer, right? Um, let's see here. Are you overly optimistic or overly pessimistic? 
That's a good question. I would say, I would say, you know, I'd say my my sinful side sure. is overly, like pessimistic, but the side that is being touched more by grace is, is being more and more optimistic. Got it. Okay. Uh, bad haircut or a bad dye job? Oh, brother. Um, well, I would never dye my hair, but I guess if I had to pick, I'd yeah. prefer that haircut. <laughs> Pineapple pizza or candy corn? Ooh, um, candy corn. I'm not going to lie. Okay. Candy corn kind of goes hard for me. All right. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, vacation or staycation? Ooh, um, I'd say vacation. Let's see. Oh, art museum or history museum? History museum, hands history down, because history is going to have some art in it. That's true. That's and hopefully, true. and hopefully, avoid, and hopefully, avoid modern art, whatever that is. Got it. Okay. Yo, Margo in the house. Margo loves pineapple pizza. And her, oh, favorite she, okay. spot, it, her favorite spot is down in South Side Chicago. Uh, you you like uh, so cooking or being cooked for? <laughs> oh, well, I'd say probably if I had to pick, I'd say being cooked for only because my mom's one of the best cooks in the world. But I do love to cook. So. Okay. <laughs> Would you rather go to a play or a stand-up show? Um, a play, probably. Just because okay. so many so many stand up shows nowadays are so immoral, I, oh, you know, yeah, not all of them, but a lot of them are, and so that's just why I'm like, I don't know, bad taste in my mouth. I, I stand corrected. Margot does not like pineapple on pizza. Uh, would you rather attend a party or host a party? Ooh, um, probably host. Nice. So, when when do I show up? <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather lose um yeah, any, any year maybe? I don't know. <laughs> no, no. Would you rather lose sleep or skip a meal? Um, I'd say what would be better for me would be to lose sleep, just because fasting for me is definitely somewhat easy. And so learning how to lose sure. sleep would be good. Okay. Uh last question. TLM or Reverend Nova Soto? Um, yeah, I personally I mean I personally think a reverend note in a sort of somewhat of an oxymoron just because I think that the issue mainly is the missile itself. That's my personal okay. opinion based off of the research that I've done, which is on my show, by the way. Um, so yeah. I would say traditional Latin mass all the way. Yeah, I agree too. That. That's why we, I drive an hour just to get there. Same. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's move on. I want to know, and I'll give you as much as time as you want. Tell me, a, a, you have a great conversion story. Tell us your conversion story, uh, more specifically at the time that you had started a Bible study with the four friends, right? Mm -hmm. And how that led you to Catholicism, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, so with the growing up in like very strong evangelicalism, mm -hmm. you run into obviously a lot of anti-Catholicism. You don't see that as much as now with younger evangelicals, but definitely growing up still, you know, in like the early 2000s where there was still a lot a lot of tension that was still that there was there as as opposed to like mainline denominations so growing up i had that anti catholic bent and then me becoming calvinistic i had that anti calvin i uh, actually had that anti catholic bent i even fell in uh briefly at least in the context of online with uh kind of a, a hardcore calvinistic style cult that's here in central texas or excuse me in texas in, in and of itself so i had a, had a lot of like really strong anti catholicism but like long story becoming short, <clears throat> I was hyper scrupulous. And when I say yeah. hyper scrupulous, I don't just mean, um, you know, worried about my sins. That was definitely true. But I didn't believe for about four, the, about four years before becoming Catholic that I was saved. So when I was a kid, I thought that the way to be saved was, you know, pray a prayer, you're saved, and that's it. You know, you're going to go to heaven. Right, 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 right. Very much so what theologically you could call easy believism. So just pray a prayer, and then when that's tied to the doctrine of eternal security, which states that um, no matter what you do post salvation, I mean, there's there's varying degrees of it, but roughly speaking, it's like if you're saved, no matter what you do post that moment of salvation, you will be saved. Um, so you could go and commit murder, you'd still be saved. 
definitely not all Calvinists believe in that. So I don't want, I want to at least be fair to them, but sure. there is definitely an evangelical version that you can find that's somewhat in there. So I was, but I didn't think I was saved. And the reason I didn't think I was saved was I was reading scripture and I was realizing that like good fruit is a sign of being saved, right? It is a, um, requirement if you will uh, or evidence rather of you being legitimately saved and i just looked at my life and i was just like it is not true because as an example when you read mark chapter 7 and you see our lord talk about like he's the pharisees are coming to him and they're saying things like you know why would you um why do your disciples you know not wash their hands before eating and then christ says like it's not that which is outside of man that defiles but what comes up from within and he gives mm. this whole litany. He says, you know, fornication and theft and murder and adultery. But he would say stuff like evil thoughts. And I would read in Jeremiah chapter 6 where scripture would talk about like, uh, like wash yourself from your evil thoughts that you may be saved. And I was just like, there's not a day that a, an evil thought doesn't come into my mind, that I don't say something that's immoral, that I don't think something that's immoral. And so I was just so scrupulous. And so I was just like, there's not good fruit in my life. It, 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 it's just, I don't see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness in my life. I see mm -hmm. the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, um, just everywhere. And so I was just like, I do not believe I'm saved. And so for four years, I every day for hours just poured over scripture and mm -hmm. prayed and just asked God, please save me. I just don't know. Like I, I'm waiting for this like miracle moment where I'm going to be zapped from heaven and my whole life will be radically changed for Christ. Sure. And so I would go out into the woods and I would just be agonizing for hours saying, God save me. And it was just so intense because the way I viewed God was I viewed God as a very angry, wrathful God who just like, it wasn't just that he was just, which is absolutely true. And it wasn't just that he's angry at sin, which is true, but it was like, that God wants to like, you know, slay me right now, that, that, that he would like take delight in that, you know, that it was very vengeful, if you will. So it was an inordinate amount of justice. Mm -hmm. And what was so terrifying about that is like, when you believe that, and for years and years and years, you don't see your life changing. You're just like, I don't know, maybe it is God's will that I be damned. Maybe I am one of the elect reprobate, if you will. Right, right, right. Um, and so I'm just like suffering. But I kept crying out to God, just begging him to save me. And then I finally one day had a friend who this was in the context of were, myself and some other guys were about to start this Bible study. I had a friend who invited me to go to mass with her. Now, I don't know why I said yes, to be honest. <laughs> I think I said yes, mainly out of like courtesy, because yeah. I was obviously anti-Catholic. Yeah, you had anti-Catholic sentiments, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's like I knew what a Catholic Mass was like because I was a mm -hmm. theology nerd. I even knew about the difference between the TLM and the, and the Nova Soto before becoming Catholic. Wow, as a Calvinist you did. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. And as I said to, to Anthony once, I said, like, we Calvinists, like the true, like the hardcore Calvinists, we would say we can debate what we would call the real Catholics, which we call the Tridentine Catholics. That's what we would call them. We were like, those are the real Catholics because they would, they actually try to convert us. When we talk to like your average Catholic on the street, you know, they're getting drunk on Saturday night, stumbling into the confessional, going to mass on Sunday, you know, and we're mm. like, where's the change of life? You know, scripture says, you know, all things become new and that those who have experienced Christ will not live unto themselves anymore, but will live unto him who died for them and rose again from the dead. So it's like, mm. where is this evidence? Like we don't see the evidence in there in your life. So how can you, genuinely say you've met christ christ says yes. like if you've known me you will do the will of the father well the will of the father is your sanctification and right. so for us we were like i don't know but i went i actually i don't know why i, I think it was out of courtesy i went and so i was sitting it's, in mass it's funny though because dr james white still makes that distinction between the catholics yeah no he's he still yeah. does and i and i'd say yeah. i would say i mean so i'd say that now as a catholic there's a lot of nuance to that argument right. but i'd say that there is a certain fairness that you can apply in the sense that i'm not saying that people go to the nova sort of aren't catholic or anything um sure. what I can, oh, yeah yeah but what i'm saying is it's like just that classic argument of lex orandi lex credendi right, over time right, right. what you experience will affect the way you believe and what you pray 
And so mm-hmm. it's like, if you are praying prayers over a long experience of time, which are not propitiatory in nature, mm-hmm. then how can you, like, I mean, how many people who go to the new mass go and think while they're there, we are offering up a propitiatory, meaning a sacrifice to appease the wrath of God because of my sins. How it's many not a, people are yeah, there? it's not a natural, um, you really have to know what you're going into before you do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, you have to know that, and you're, and it's like yeah. you're not going to get that from your hand missile. You're not going to no. hear that really talked about. You yeah. maybe once in a while will hear a random prayer that might allude to something along the nature, but if yeah. you hear the term sacrifice, it's all going to be within the context of say sacrifice of praise, which is yes. a separate theological distinction from sacrifice of propitiation. Correct. Um, and so the scary thing is, is it's like if you think that over time, and then you also get used to seeing Eucharistic abuses. You also get in the know and you realize like, wow, all these signs of the cross are removed. All these genuflections are removed. All these like things in the, like for instance, the original new mass missile did not even have the word transubstantiation in it. Mm. Like that is something that most people don't know, but that is something that's extremely worrying to say the least. This is the 69 missile you're saying? Yeah, the original 1969 missile and the right. and then the, the 1970 as well did right. not have the term transubstantiation. Now it is now it in the new mass missile today it is in the the newer sure. editions. In sure. The original it wasn't. And the scary thing is this is it's like, you know, when we look at the Ottaviante intervention, you know, we often focus on that specific definition of the mass that is given right. in the new mass missile, which is you know borderline heretical. I'm not saying it is heretical, but it leaves it omits so much that's necessary. It doesn't talk about propitiatory sacrifice, about the sacerdotal nature of the priesthood, about mm-hmm. um, you know the the reverence for for Christ that is needed. Um, and so what ends up ha- it, what ends up happening is that when the critique is given by Ottaviani and the cardinals, what ends up happening is that they change the the definition. But then nothing else in the missile is changed. And the critique is about the missile itself, not just about this definition. And so when we see the fact that nothing's really changed and something continues to go on, oh, he's a great guy. I haven't talked to him, but I like his uh, his material. No, um, man, he's, he's one of the best best out there. Yeah, yeah I remember much watching love, him. Much love to Albrecht, man. So the coolest yeah, guy ever. Guy. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, you're good. But yeah, no, so those things are really concerning. How this ties into my story, though, is it's like when I went to my first Mass was the context of the Novus Ordo, and I remember we got to the Gospel, and it was, and this goes to show you how God's loving providence works. It was of all passages of Scripture, the story of the prodigal son, which hit home so hard because I hear about this son who was wayward, ungrateful, filled with sin, had done so much wickedness in his life and had essentially mocked his father, like had shamed his father by demanding inheritance and then taking that hard-earned money of his father and going and squandering it on prostitutes and on wicked lives. And I don't think we understand that. Like, I mean, it was such a, I mean, just picture if you're, if you're a parent out there, like you give your, like your child comes up, demands their inheritance. I want my money now. And then they go and waste it on drugs, on prostitution, et cetera. Like, what does that do to your family name, especially in a culture of honor? So I'm hearing this and I just hear in the depths of my soul, it's time to come home. And that kind of was the spark that started the journey. So I remember going back home. Like, I remember after the mass was done, my friend was like, well, what did you think? And I remember, like, cordially thanking her for the experience, you know, and then departing. That night was when the Bible study started. Of, so it was, it was perfect. And so what I did was, is I went home, so cool. wrote out every objection that I had to the Catholic Church which was a long list because this was not, you know, just random, like Billy Baptist doesn't like the Pope. This was like, okay, I've read Calvin. I've read Edwards. I've read Whitfield. I've read, you know, Sproul, MacArthur, White, things like that. There's some legitimate issues. So when we started the Bible and so I was like, okay, I'm going to go issue by issue and I need to be convinced of it all. Because for me, I really have to be convinced if if I'm going to sign up for something such as my potential eternal life. As, as you, you should know, be. Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
like I want to be like whenever you hear sometimes conversion stories where they're just like, well, I liked this girl, and so I converted. I'm just like, <laughs> would you do that if she was or something? Like, you know, think about this a bit more. Um, and so what ends up happening is we start this Bible study with two goals: one to know the truth, because we did not feel that the like kind of non-denominational churches around us were giving us the truth. But then at the same time, we also wanted to combat sin because we all recognize the sin in our own lives. And none of us thought we were saved. We all wanted to like actually find Christ and truly be rid of our sins and uh, walk free from them. So what ended up happening is we went issue by issue through the claims of the Catholic Church. And long story short, what just absolutely obliterated me and I recognized that this was a massive error in my in my academic formation, was I had never in a serious way been exposed to the writings of the church fathers. And the fathers obliterate Protestants. There are, there are, there are no seen No, they, they exactly. I mean, when you're when you're you know 21 <laughs> years old like I am, and you believe that baptism is just a symbol, but then you yeah. realize, wow, every single father on John chapter three, verse five interprets this as baptism. Okay. I have one of two conclusions. Either all of the fathers, a ton of them who knew, right? The disciples are heretics and I am saved or incorrect, or I'm the heretic and they're saved and I'm in big trouble. Um, That was it. But picture that, but times like 50 plus issues. That's what basically kept happening. I would go issue by issue by issue. Some issues, you know, were a little bit more of, I could see arguments back and forth. So like, as an example, when it came to the papacy, that question about the East, right? Really right, diving into right, you know, right. the East, more authentic in this, is the West more authentic in this, um, really wrestling with Our Lady, wrestling with the sacraments. But what ended up happening is that eventually I got convinced, right? I got convinced of all these things and I said, okay, sure. well, I need to like, you know, make sure I'm all good. So one thing that I made sure to do is I read through the Catechism of the Council of Trent because I was like, look, I want a legit Catholic catechism. I want a catechism aimed at Protestants, like at, <laughs> at me. And so I went That's and read that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I went and read that. And then I went to the local parish. Now, this is where the story gets interesting. Went to the local parish. Went to, approximately, <laughs> <laughs> went to approximately three <laughs> masses. And uh-huh. after the third one... I remember praying, Lord, I know that this church believes that you are present in the Eucharist, whereas I have always believed that this was a symbol. But I do not believe that any of these people believe that you are in the Eucharist. And that was one of the toughest prayers that I've ever prayed. And the reason I prayed that was because I was so scandalized by what I was seeing. Like it was just, you know, not just, I'm not just talking about like corny music, but like extremely immodest clothing um very very like sappy homilies and again i'm not trying to be rude this was just my personal experience going through it It was just very very um watered down and it was so scandalous especially when it came to me seeing how they treated our lord that i thought i don't know if i can convert and this is one something i want people to understand like scandal is real it is absolutely real and i as someone who is potentially coming to the faith was absolutely scandalized because I was like, if like, I have never seen God, but if you believe this is God, how could you be doing what you guys are doing? Like, this is the one that Moses had to be hidden the rock from when he passed by and he only got to see his backside. This is the one who walked on water. This is the one who raised people from the dead. This is the one who like spoke to uh, Isaiah, right? And, or excuse me, uh, Elijah and the still small voice, right? That uh, brought Enoch, right, up into heaven, right? right? All these types of things. Like, this yeah. is God Almighty, and you're passing them out like it's Ritz crackers. Munchables. Like, I, I, I don't – yeah, and I was just like, I, I don't see why and, – and all I hear in the back of my head is Revelation chapter 2 – or excuse me, chapter 3 talking about the Laodicean church. I will spew you out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, is, th- this is insane. What I did was I went online and I just typed in because I knew about this. I typed in Latin Mass near me because mm. I was just like, I like Gregorian chant. Sounds kind of cool aesthetically. Let's just see if try it out. So I found one and it was where I go currently, uh, the cathedral and St. Mary's Cathedral in Austin. And there was a high requiem mass at 7 wow. a.m. in the morning, All Souls Day. Now mm. I go, I go with my dad, who again is a, a lapsed Catholic. We go, we sit in the very back. 
and the scola starts, right? Mass starts. And I remember instantly thinking, there's absolutely no way that this is not a recording. This is the most beautiful music I've ever heard because it was <laughs> all, it was the 1605 like Queen Victoria Palestrine Polyphony version of the Requiem Mass. Everyone should go and look up. It's absolutely beautiful. And what I saw transpose over the next hour and a half was everything that I had read from the Council of Trent and from the Catechism of the Council of Trent now come to life in front yeah. of me. Yeah. And yeah. when I finally saw the Eucharist being held up as it's being incensed, as it's been going up, right, with candles all around, I say, my Lord and my God, this mm. is, this makes sense. This is how you ought to be treated. And this is a sacrifice for my sins yeah. and so i kept going back i kept going back i was a, i was hooked and my friends <laughs> they I drug them along right they kind of had their own journeys they had yeah. their own issues with the final nail in the coffin uh, and this is where all essentially the testimony ends as opposed to where it continues today is my last holdout was in the context of the emotions because you know we are body and soul and you know we do have a spiritual nature intellect yeah. and will but we also have uh, a rational animal's nature rational right. animal being the ability uh, you know to reason but we also have that bodily portion of us and i oh yeah absolutely yeah mass That's the ages right. 100 um great documentary fantastic yeah and great people who make the documentary by the absolutely. way absolutely fantastic absolutely. people um and what i experienced was when I realized that Catholicism was most likely true, <laughs> I had, yeah, it, it, I had the most insane, like, wow, I have been potentially blaspheming God my whole life, right. as well as calling his church an antichrist church. I was so terrified and so convicted and so disgusted that I didn't eat for three days. Mm. Like, I was just, I was, it, it wasn't, uh. it wasn't, I was fasting it was i was repulsed at the smell of food it was just too much so finally i remember how it, how god really broke me was i used to work at a grocery store right heb here in texas long long time ago and it was a morning where i was just i was getting some extra hours i was volunteering and i was pushing carts and this was at like you know 6 a.m in the morning it's dark outside still it's winter so it's cold it's raining outside. It's very pictorial for what I'm about to say. Right. And it, it was perfect for how I felt internally because I felt as if there was a hurricane of emotions going on inside of me and that there were two sides pulling at my heart. One, right. what my brain knew to be right, but then two, all of my experiences, which says, if you become a Catholic, you are going to hell. That is the, That was the war that was just battling inside of me. Now, what I'm about to say... Some people might say it's very subjective, and I admit this, but this is, again, just my personal experience. Sure. I remember in that moment just being like, look, if anyone knows if Catholicism is true, I've been praying to God. I've been asking the Holy Spirit to lead me. I need to test this. It would be Mary. And so I remember, <laughs> like, in the rain, just kind of kneeling down in the rain in this empty parking lot, just being like, Mary, I do not know if you can hear me. I do not know if you'll be mad at what I'm about to say. So I don't know. If, I don't know if Christ will be mad at what I'm about to say, but I don't know what to do. Please show me the truth. Mm. And in that moment, it was a massive. It was almost like I was electrocuted because what happened in that moment is that I was baptized in peace, and that hurricane of emotion that was in me became a still pool of water. And what happened was it was so severe that my brain knew something was going on yeah. out of body in a certain sense, like happening to me. And it was still trying to deny what was going on. It was just like, no, 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 something's not happening to you. But yes, something is happening to you. <laughs> like something is absolutely happening. And so in that moment, I was just like, I'm going to become Catholic. So yeah. I went home. My parents, who, again, I did not know how they re react because I, I kind of thought that maybe they'd be pretty mad. They were providentially in Rome of all places. Uh, when I gave him a phone call and I was just like, look, uh, one thing I mean, I forgot to mention is like one of the things I wanted to do growing up was, was I wanted to be a pastor and start my own church. Like that was a huge dream of mine growing sure, up. Sure. And so I told him, I was just like, I can't do that. 
I know this has been my dream my whole life, but I have been studying Catholicism. I've been really trying to be academically rigorous and I'm going to become Catholic. Like, I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to become Catholic. And my parents were like, sounds good. And it was so unexpected. I was like, <laughs> sounds good. And what's been beautiful to see <laughs> is that my mom and dad have gone from a place of kind of just like somewhat anti-Catholicism to now they have gone with me about 10 times or so to the Latin mass, loved it each time. Mm. My mother is actually starting to go to Eucharistic adoration with me. So I'm working on yeah. her, getting her closer yeah. to that conversion. But I think yeah. what's so beautiful is that like, what I learned in all of this was that my view of God was wrong and that God is who he says he is in divine scripture. He is mm -hmm. love. He is charity. It's not a love, a sappy, emotional sentimentalism, do what you want. It nope. is God willed my good and my good was him. And so when I recognize like God wills my good, he wills for me to be with him in heaven. And that yes. the way I go to heaven is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which I see its merits renewed at the sacrifice of Calvary in the sacrifice of the mass. That is what's worth living. Right. So how long ago did it, uh, did you, I was in 2020. Enter the church. Uh, and so it was in the middle of the COVID nonsense. And what was interesting is what happened during that whole time was um, during my like, initial portion of really studying everything out 2019 uh some of you guys might remember that was the time of the amazonian synod now yeah that's right yeah, yeah. we can have all the cope we want all day long about what, yeah. what it was <laughs> but let me tell you what it looked like from a baptist perspective who already had a problem with images coming in okay <laughs> it, it was so bad i was just like okay are you trying to convince me that you like worship statues because what is going on here? I mean, again, we can right. try to be nuanced about it, but I'm just like, look, PR wise alone, divorcing theology it was a horrible, look. absolutely. PR horrible. wise, it was horrible. Absolutely mm -hmm. horrible. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's beautiful. Do you think that if your parents were not in Rome, they would have, uh, <laughs> they would have reacted differently. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. And maybe maybe those churches had a little bit of effect on them as they, they were could have, around, right? but, Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think what it was more than anything else was it's like they know that my heart wants to serve God with my whole life. Right. In whatever context that he calls me to. And so I think that in their minds they were like, you know, we trust what he wants to do, right? We trust where he's at. And so maybe we don't agree with it, but we can at least um, accept it, you know. And so yeah. it's very, very good. Thankfully for me, also religion and politics, it's always been a very open and normal conversation to have in our household. It's never really been taboo. And so like we yeah. arguably talk about maybe them a bit, at least pol politics, maybe a bit too much. Um, but but yeah, so, like it, it was fine. Which is cool. That's what that's really great. And then. I nobody on earth is going to know you more than your parents. And they probably mm -hmm. knew that if you were going to make a decision, it's not rash. It, it's, it's, you did your rigorous studying and, and, and were convinced because you're a logical person. Um, and it was the same thing for me. Uh, the church fathers is what got me back because I did leave the, the faith, the Protestant faith for about almost a year. The fathers were the ones that brought me back. And with our lady, I, I actually asked our Lord to show me, that your mother is should be venerated the way she's supposed to be. Um, I didn't ask Our Lady; I asked Our Lord, <laughs> and, uh, and it, yeah. wasn't as, it wasn't as instantaneous with me. But um, a few a, a few months after that, it was it was clear it's clear as day. So um, now I'm going to uh, move on just mm -hmm. to last my last bit of questions. Um, so sure, yeah. and it's it's just going to be uh, a question about faith. And but more, 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 um, just more specific questions. So, Treasure Island, you, uh, the Desert Island, you're, you're stuck in the island. You can only take three Catholic books with you. You can, you can add the scriptures if you want to or not. But what are the three Catholic books that you can read for the rest of your life? Okay, so the scripture is already included in that. If you want, if you want to include the scriptures, you can. Okay, yes, as, so as would... one book. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So I would include the scriptures, right? Copy of the scriptures. I would also say copy of the Summa, not surprising, <laughs> being right, a Thomas. Right. <laughs> um, it, it, it's somewhat of my meat and drink. 
yeah. and then probably if I had to pick one book aside from that, mm -hmm. it's a good question. I would probably pick St. Francis's de Sales' Introduction to the Devout Life, nice. only because while there is, of course, better manuals in the context of ascetic theology that like really focuses it on the interior life. Yes. There's really one just great devotional where I mean, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like imitation of Christ, but I'd still pick uh introduction to the devout life just because it is so practical and it is so well well written that you'll sure. be always able to go back and at least glean something from it. And because most of us, um, you know, this is just goes to show you the reality of how much we should better ourselves by the context of God's grace in cooperating with grace. So many of us remain in that first stage of the purgative way, which is kind of sad, like 90 plus percent of Catholics die in that stage. And yeah, so that's true. That would be good. Yeah. I take that. Yeah. yeah. I got a song called under construction. And then there I say, I'm stuck in my purgative stage mm -hmm. <laughs> on the song. Um, Not okay, bad. So next, next question. Well, oh wait, actually, let, let me ask a side question here. Um, did you know St. Thomas? As a Calvinist, or was it was it after your conversion that you started studying St. Thomas? I so I, I would have known who he was, but honestly, I couldn't have told you really anything he believed. Okay. Um, because again, that was just not our wheelhouse. Because for right, right. Calvinism, it's like most of the you know barnacles on the bark of the boat that started pulling it underwater was like the medieval days. Like yeah, all this superstition yeah. is the medieval days, which is funny because that's exactly what the modernists say and the neo modernists say today. It's right. always just hating on the medievals in some type of fashion. But I got exposed to St. Thomas mainly because when I was converting, again, I converted in the context of traditionalism. I actually yeah. saw a video uh, by another YouTuber. Shout out to Brian Holdsworth. He actually made a video mm -hmm. about St. Thomas many years ago. I remember mm -hmm. watching that video and just being like, wait a minute. You're, like, you're talking about some stuff that I already see, some issues that I see. I'm going to check out the St. Thomas guy. And I did not know what I was getting into, but let's just put it this way. I ended up joining for a long time, especially during undergrad, the Thomistic Institute, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. we went through uh, a greater portion of the whole Summa. And so by the time I was already 22, I'd already read through most of the Summa. And that got me into reading also the commentaries of Father Garrett Goulacrange. Also, mm. uh, there's new translations now of uh, the great Cardinal Cajetan's work, which are coming out in July. Because right. ultimately, to be a Thomas, it's not like tip for anyone who's wanting to get into Thomas. You know, obviously, be gentle on yourself starting off. You probably need a little philosophical training first because it takes a little time. You know, don't worry about it. But what is the main issue, I think, for a lot of people that they don't understand is that to be a Thomas, it's not just that you go back, you flip open the Summa. And you just glean some information and walk away from it. Like there's there's merits to that, but sure. to be a Thomist is to join a large conversation that has been happening for 600 years, sure. where it's all of the commentators who have been commentating on the works of Thomas. And Thomism is a is a way of doing theology, you know, continuing to ask questions. Yeah. And so, reading through the writings of you know Cajetan or Charles Ballard or John of Saint Thomas or Garrigou Lagrange, and right. every one of these theologians they Com they write commentaries on Thomas's works, but then they also write manuals or theological treatises using the Summa. And this is how the church used to operate. And I really wish that we'd go back to this because we really need it more now than ever. Mm -hmm. They would use Thomas in proper Thomistic thinking in combating the errors of modern philosophy and the errors of our day. Correct. And one of the things that I'm doing on my show starting in a couple of weeks is I'm going to basically be doing that, but in a video context where I'm like, okay, I'm going to talk about cultural commentary right like a, a political show but i'm going to do it from mm -hmm. a thomas perspective we need that we need we need especially in the world of conservatism we need solid philosophical foundations to, to right. gear us so that we're not just like well conservatism is just liberalism but 10 years slower like it can't be it's not that right. <laughs> um yeah. and so getting into that i think is what we need to do. and as a church oh man we need to return to that so fast because right. i mean when, when you see the reality of you know like thanks be to God, I convert, but then six people leave as I convert. And, uh, you know, we also see, you know, uh, at least on a, like a bishopric level, you know, whole dioceses and whole bishops conferences, apostatizing, yeah. going into, into spiritual schism. When we see even on Catholic YouTube, the best that Catholic YouTube can really offer nowadays is to basically be the Pope's lawyer. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, the state of Catholic theology on YouTube is, 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 is really, really weak. And I'm telling myself I need to do better as, my, as well. And so I'm like, 
let's get back to Thomas. Let's get back to these manuals. Let's get back to like hardcore authentic theology. I couldn't living, agree more. And helping people through it, you know? I couldn't agree more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, is, correct me if I'm wrong. Farvo, is it Farvo one of the great top to Thomistic thinkers? I think that's yeah, name. he would be. I, can't, I don't know if he was involved in the Dominican order of my memory. Okay. Correct or not, but to my knowledge, yeah, he would be one of what you would consider in the the Thomistic family tree or the Thomistic commentator line. There's several hundred theologians, sure, but you, you, you consider. Him. Yeah, I love Gary Gill. He was my favorite. I think he's the best theologian in the, uh, the 20th century. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah. I always tell yeah. people, I'm like, look, if you if you have a little bit of like study done in theology, read Gary Gill's early writing yeah. or his spiritual writings first. But if you want to get like legit theology, go read Gary Gill. Because maybe this sounds a little harsh, but I personally think that reading Garagu, you're just going to get so much better of the 99% of what you'd get today. There's definitely yes. some very good theologians today. Yeah. One great theologian, shout out to a friend of mine, Dr. Matthew Minard. I don't know if he'll want me to mention him, but great theologian, great Thomistic theologian who's translated a lot of Garagu. Nice. Um, but honestly, sometimes when I see modern Catholic theology, some of the stuff that they're working on, I'm just like, what is going on, man? I know, yeah. yeah. Gary Goose stuff going? on on the on the on the moral theology on virtue and stuff like that is just it's so great. I remember I was, I was somebody uh, in our parish asked the priest and said, um, "How come um, Saint Alphonse is, is not uh, moral theology is not taught in the fraternity uh, seminaries?" And his response was, "Is because we teach Saint Thomas's, and it's pretty much the same because a lot of the stuff that Saint Alphonse has got was from Saint Thomas." Yeah, no, absolutely. When you read um, St. Alphonsus's, so everyone everyone probably knows about this if you're in the trad world, but Father Prumer's Handbook of Moral Theology, very good book. Yeah. Very yes. Thomistic because it's coming from yeah. a Dominican in the 1920s. Right, but right. Father, but St. Alphonsus, his work is phenomenal as well because while it's a little bit harder for people to read because they have to know some historical context of what he's writing, right. um, it is phenomenal because what you end up getting is he uses he, he he rarely disagrees with Aquinas. Areas right. where he disagrees on, it's very much so probable opinions, and uh, it's phenomenal. So you can't get any better than Saint Alphonsus. Oh yeah, absolutely, it's my favorite. We have a question here. What do you think of Rene Girard? I honestly don't know if I've been fully exposed to this or not. So I don't know, Gaon. Yeah, I don't know if I. The name is ringing a faint bell, but to be yeah. completely honest, I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, no worries. Well, next question. If you could pick any saint, father, apostle, or just, I guess, saints in the, in the past um, that, that you could bring back to interview on your on, on, on your YouTube channel, who would it be? It would, so, I mean, that's a hard question because I have so <laughs> many that I love. Yeah. What people would might find interesting that, oddly enough, my patron saint that I chose was not St. Thomas, mm. but was actually St. Peter. Because I chose St. Peter, one, because he is, I wanted to show that fidelity to Rome, but also um, I wanted to, which is actually, it's my, it's my third order religious name, Brother Peter Mary. Um, that's my third order religious name. Okay. Um, but then the second, uh, and the second reason would be is that you see Peter mess up so much in scripture, but the Lord restores him in such beautiful ways. Mm. But if I had to pick one, it'd be Our Lady, hands down. I, I really don't see why you'd want to interview anybody, anybody else. else. <laughs> Perfect, sinless creature who her love for mankind would melt anybody instantaneously, you know, the hardest of hearts. I mean, she is the mediatrix of all graces. Yeah. She is, I believe, the co-redemptrix of grace and just phenomenal. phenomenal. She was the greatest theologian of all time. Absolutely, because she, yeah. she, she believed our Lord when he said that he would die and rise again yeah. whereas the apostles doubted and she was at the foot of the cross in perfect virtue submitting to the will of god as she did yeah. her entire life and i'm like right. the, the thing is is it's like we it's very popular in catholic culture to do con marian consecrations but i really think that people need to really examine and realize like what true marian consecration is yeah. i mean it's your life and every action as a sacrifice to mary to give to christ and through mary to give to christ and 
when you and when you become serious about that that will absolutely change your life it's like if you're struggling with sin out there if you're struggling with habitual sin especially sins against the sixth and ninth commandments go to our lady there's all these yes. there's other great saints go to saint joseph go to saint aloysius gonzaga things like that mm -hmm. but our lady is the one who's going to clean you up right and mm -hmm. so go to her mm -hmm. she'll help you great advice three more questions and we're gonna end it sure number one and people i don't care you can argue with me but this is a catholic question rooftop you're at a classy bar overlooking the city and you get to pick one drink what's your alcoholic drink to go Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, definitely, it would just be a classic whiskey and coke. So just like right? Jack Daniels oh, and coke. Okay. Very simple. Yeah, like having that. that, having that with a good chicken fried steak, you can't get better than that. You can't get better than that. Yeah. Are you a cigar guy too, or pipe? You like pipe better? Both. I prefer pipes just because I feel like pipes you get a little bit more of a natural flavor. Sure. But I. I but cigars are great. I think I smoke cigars a little bit more than pipes just because it is easier. Yeah, I always tell people I say cigars. I say pipes are like fine women they take a little bit of work but they're well worth it <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah but yeah i enjoy both it's like my wife <laughs> well worth it um so my other question uh was uh god forbid this happens anytime soon but you're on your deathbed and uh you, you need last rites extreme unction you can pick one clergy in, in the world today that will administer your your last rites Who's on your bedside? Who are you picking? I would say definitely that's tough because there's two that immediately came to mind. So the sure. two that came to mind were Father Chad Ripperger, right? Uh -huh. Kind of, uh, I mean, like, come on. Come right, on. Right. Can you get better? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and can, then yeah. Father Isaac, I might be mispronouncing his last name. Is it Aureli? Aureli? Uh, Aurelia? Aurelia. It's called the, yeah, Isaac Aurelia. Mary. Isaac Mary. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a tough choice. But I think if I had to pick between the two of them, I would pick Father Chad just because okay. um he, you know his knowledge is so vast and right. being very much so you know ec like uh, being an experienced exorcist yeah i feel like you would be able to ask those really good questions to really right. see like yeah. what are those contributions now again of course father isaac is very steeped in saint alfonso so he could definitely do a lot of the same but i also feel like it's like That's well right. if you have saint alfonso saint thomas but you're also an exorcist. I'm like, well, there's a little bit of <laughs> So I take uh, Father Father Ripperger. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Father Isaac would be so so cool to be on the on the side. Uh, for me, it is going to depend on how big the room is between the two. If the room mm -hmm. is really small, I'm picking Father Ripperger because Father <laughs> Isaac couldn't fit in. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. So my last question is, um, well, then talking about one of the best Thomas to live today is Father, Father Ripperger. He's, he's one of the best Thomas, you know, we have in the country, if not the world. Mm -hmm. um, so my last question is, is 2025, Holy Father Pope uh, Francis has passed away. Um, Conclave is on. They say, Nick Cavazos, we need you as, as God forbid. Pope, right? We got white smoke. We must pop him. Uh, you are the new pope. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you give me two things. Number one, uh, what is your pontiff name? And number two, uh, what are some things that you would do to kind of help the church uh, move along to a, in a better direction? Yeah. I, so I feel like I mean I definitely don't want that job. I feel like probably <laughs> I, I don't either. either. <laughs> do not need the job. Because uh, it's like, I mean, it's like, it's like you know, if someone wants to be an exorcist, they should never be an yeah. exorcist because they've been right, right, right. I think right. that like time a zillion being the man who is in charge to lead the world to heaven. Like, okay. Right. Um, if I had to pick one, I would yeah. pick this one for devotional reasons, but then two, just because it would also lead in well to the second. It's, it's very predictable, but it would be Pius the 13th sure. because I have a huge devotion to Pius V as a Dominican, mm. uh, but also to so. Pius X, um, who is a phenomenal reformer. Um, so I would pick Pius XIII, uh, which would also segue into the pontificate because I would basically have this type of step program. Step number one, I would call all the bishops to Rome. This is just me kind of off the cuff, but I'd call all the bishops to Rome. And I would immediately regular regularize the Society of St. Pius X and I would, at the same time, uh, 
review all the bishops and fire a bunch. I'd, I'd yeah. say, I hate to say it, I hate to do it, but you're fired. You know, I'd have to turn into Donald Trump, and I just, and I would just fire him. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I, I'm serious. Like, I would fire a lot, and it's not that I would want to be mean about it. I'm not saying this right. in the context of like you guys should hate your bishops, pray for your right. bishops, right. do acts of right. penance for your bishops. Uh, I'm just saying, like, if this is purely executive, that's how I'm, I'm viewing it. I would probably fire a lot of them. Thomas <laughs> Aquinas. That would be Thomas Aquinas would be a pretty Chad name. Not gonna lie. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, no. So I would do that. I would also then. So I would replace them with new bishops who are extremely orthodox. Right. Then what I would do is I would do two actions. One, I would call. I I would probably name it the Second Council of Trent. <laughs> Um, and it would be like, okay, it's cleanup time in the church, you know, playtime's yeah. over y'all. It's time. And so what right. I would do is I would put out some very long and detailed anathemas against, um, all of the modern controversy. So I would, I would do something crazy. Like, I don't know, an encyclical against the gender stuff that's going on. Like mm -hmm. the, reason, the reason that I get so frustrated, and I'm not saying this again in the context of spite toward the hierarchy, but I'm saying like, if the church has power. But we don't have an encyclical on pornography. We don't have an encyclical on homosexuality, on transgenderism, on communism, on just all the major stuff that's going on today. Yeah. And, and you see society is apostatizing. The reason it's doing this, aside from the fact that it's a chastisement of God, is it's because – and again, I want to say this in like a very loose sense, so don't take this too seriously. But like it's because the church has no power. What I mean by no power is I mean she's not exercising the power that she does have. You know, like she has that power to save the world, but we're just not exercising that power. Right, so right. If we don't exercise it, then de facto we don't have power, you know. And so what ends up happening is what I would do is I would anathematize uh, a lot of heresies, write right. a lot of social cyclicals. I would also uh, probably try to clean up some of the ambiguous language of the Second Vatican Council. Sure. But I would also I would also because I would just like, OK, let's just put this to bed, be done with it. Um, but I would also probably just have a full-on ecumenical council that would basically reimpose the Tridentine Mass with some new stuff. So I would include mm. some of the modern saints that I do believe are saints. Padre Pio being a great example, Maximilian Kobe being a great example. I'd also like to see some people canonize, so controversial, but I'd probably canonize Archbishop Lefebvre and be like, yeah, he's the doctor of the priesthood, probably do that. Um, and stuff along that nature. Um, and then I would also, in so doing that, I would reform the entire structure, like bureaucratic structure of the church. So I'd kick out all the bureaucrats, mm -hmm. right? Kick out all the bureaucrats, say, you're fired, get out of here. You know, schedule F 20, <laughs> 2025. Um, and <laughs> That's good. <laughs> we would, we would, uh, we would probably redo the whole code of canon law in light of the new council. Sure. It would be, it would be much closer to the 17 code, but also reflect a lot of medieval canons. Mm -hmm. um, I would redo seminary formation. Uh, yeah, I would do Bishop Sheen. Absolutely. He's a very extremely holy man. Um, but uh, yeah, I would redo seminary training. I'd be like, look, we're going back to Chesterton. Would you canonize Chesterton too? I look, look into it. I actually, I'll be honest. I don't know as much of Chesterton as I probably should, sure. but everything I have heard thus far, I have, loved including me reading his book the dumb ox about saint thomas mm, yeah uh, phenomenal so I'd, I'd definitely i'd look into it i'd put it that way i'd look into it um <laughs> leo the 13th see, i would canonize him the first day love oh yeah yeah, I know. yeah yeah no he wouldn't be he wouldn't be an issue um there's there's so many holy people i mean like a, a good example i'd be like yeah let's let's fast track this process with this uh this nun right who's uh who's uh who's uh yes. up. tolkien tolkien be great so yeah. I would do these actions. I would reform the seminaries because people don't understand. It's the mm. seminaries where it's one of the major problems. It's like we can debate all day long TLM versus Reverend Nova Sordo, but it's like, look, if at the end of the day, the priests aren't getting passed on the Catholic faith as it was always taught, yeah. then the issue, and if they're getting something watered down, I mean, I hear so many seminarian friends of mine who go to diocesan seminaries who say, you know, well, it's not perfect, but, uh, you know, the people are in the diocesan world and I need to supplement my learning after you know, I get ordained and I'm like, let's take that analogy, but then let's transpose that in the context of a medical doctor. So I didn't get a good, I didn't go to a good medical school, but I did, I did read some books after I got my license. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. With, with your body, plus your eternal soul. I'm like, right. uh, no, 
I'm going to go to the doctor over there who, who has every, everything together. So I would do those. And then I think the last thing I would do, so after doing like a, basically a massive restructuring of it is I would really try to emphasize devotionally in my pontificate the reality of um, living a life that is, I would I really try to impress the virtues in a very practical, easy to understand way to the people. But I would always try to loop that into the context of anchoring yourself between the two pillars of devotion to the Eucharistic heart of our Lord, mm -hmm. really encouraging Eucharistic adoration, and also at the same time, really encouraging people to have true devotion to Our Lady through the mechanism of the Holy Rosary. And yeah. so it'd be those two that I'd say, anchor yourself between those two things. Because if you anchor yourself between those two things, then while I'm up here, you know, chastising political leaders, I mean, could you picture a Pope, right? A Pope, Pius the 13th, who's just like, wait a minute, wait, 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 what? You know, Biden did what? And he, and he actually is just like, I am going to write a papal bull. Biden, you will repent or else you will not receive communion. I'm like, yeah. that's very pastoral. That's what we need. And that's extremely honoring. That is Lord. pastoral. Yeah, that's what about actual, yeah. What about happened in Ireland, right? Where the majority of Catholics mm -hmm. legalize abortion. I'd be like, yeah. okay, um, bishops, you know what you guys need to preach on. Uh, Catholics who, uh, like especially the legislature who vote on this. Okay, repent, right? You need to repent or you're out. Like, I mean, that's just how it needs to be. Not because I'm, I want to harm people, but because it's like we need to keep the body of Christ pure and we do not want to give the message, especially that's to actually people. being pastoral. You're being yeah. pastoral. At the, yeah. Yeah. What is that message that we're giving to young people? This is one thing that I get so frustrated at whenever I see people who just assume that young people are like, yeah, we just want a really cool rock show mass and everything's laid back and everything like that. I'm like, do you understand what young people are? They don't even know if there's such a thing as gender anymore, much less if there is a God. And so you have the true religion. You have the religion that was given by Christ to the apostles, mm -hmm. handed down to the state. It is able to save mankind, and you're, whether you're willing to or not, at least practically speaking, squandering that and not passing it on. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm saying I needed that faith whenever I was dying right there, like dying emotionally inside saying, where is God? I think he hates me, you know, and I'm crying out mm -hmm. in that parking lot. Mm -hmm. God comes and touches me with the mass. Like that's what's needed. And so we don't need uh, to just assume young people won't understand things. If they don't understand things, but God gives them the grace, then they're going to want to learn it anyway, right? Do actions like that. I, I even saw a gentleman, he asked a question in the comment section about, um, like, when are we doing these rosary rallies? Something that I'm, I'm kind of known for is we do these protests, right, against uh, Satanists. We do protests against drag shows and things along that nature. Um, wow. Same thing. Like, the church needs to be out there. I, we have, I have a protest that I'm going to this week. Um, it's usually large groups of Catholics. We're going out and we're protesting these different things. Catholics need to be involved in culture way more. Yes, it's, yes. See, it's so easy yeah. to be black -pilled. It's so easy to be like, oh, well, you know, we lost the election. Everything's over. I'm just going to go homestead in the woods and maybe right. I'll survive the apocalypse. I'm like, okay, you can do that if you want, but I'm going to be, by God's grace, around here for a lot longer, and I am going to fight for my nation right. to become yeah. a holy nation. That's that why I like That's what it is. Yeah, that, that's why I, I, I like and respect. So some people say it's controversial, but I don't know if you you know John Doyle. Oh, that's yeah, why yeah. I, 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 I like Doyle. John. I like John mm -hmm. Doyle a lot because he's doing that. I mean, he's got a megaphone and he's out there antagonizing all of them. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's – so, um, you know, we need young people like you guys who are disciplined. That's what we need first is discipline. Mm -hmm. You guys are disciplined, very logical, understand how these things work go out there the last thing we need is people who are overly emotional because they could get pretty bad i mean your attentions might be great but there needs to be discipline and, and, and intelligence too so yeah absolutely hey, hey man I, I i enjoyed this so much i think a lot of people did uh, uh people ask questions and, and and thank you for coming on I and mean, i appreciate yeah, it so absolutely. much nicholas yeah yeah no absolutely i really i appreciate your invite so it was fun getting to Sit down. Hopefully, maybe if we sit down with Anthony, I can get to know you a little bit because I feel like it's a little bit of a one-sided conversation. But yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, this is what it's, this was also about. This is all about you. Um, this is what the get to know is. Uh, and um, I got I, I had uh, Ray Rahalva from Joy of the Faith. Um, mm -hmm. 
um, on I think Saturday it was our, my first in studio because I know the guy. He's really he's really great. Um, he, he goes to my parish, uh, and then my next one is going to be uh, I, I gotta get his name, but he's he's the Martyr Walk. Have you heard it? You heard of it? The Martyrs Walk. It's just, it's oh a, yeah, yeah, no, that yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So I'm gonna inter interview him. We're gonna talk about the Martyrs Walk a little bit and, and get, trying to get to know him as well. So. Um, but yeah, man, I'm just, uh, if anybody else you could think of, you could throw my way. I'd love to interview them. I just want to get to know you guys and, 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 and share with you guys through the Catholic world. Your, your channel is in the description below. So everybody click on that. Uh, it, it'll lead, it'll lead you, lead them to your Instagram too, like you said. Yeah. Instagram page will be linked in the links on the YouTube page. So go follow mm -hmm. me over there for uh, daily post shenanigans and, protesting drag queens so all kinds of interesting stuff all day let's do it <laughs> get me motivated to make some memes all right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> maybe i should i should make a song that'd be fun anyway um, yeah, do it yeah anti-track drag song uh but hey man thanks again uh, uh god bless you um and then we'll see you guys all later um get to know series continues on next week peace